Bandwidth for this podcast is brought to you by ID8 Software. Be sure to check out all of their great Revit applications designed to increase your productivity. Hi, this is Bill from BIM Thoughts. Thank you for listening today. Please hold the line for the rest of the podcast. We have Olivia Morgan with us today. And Hello. she does a lot of things. But we're going to let her define herself so that we can figure out what to talk about. Uh, well, very good. Thank you for that intro. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> my name's Olivia Morgan. I am owner and founder of Model Space. We build architectural models, physical models for architects, engineers, product designers. And we recently started offering some AR surfaces, services on top of the model building. And I'm also a LinkedIn learning instructor and a consultant for building out model shops in uh, other firms. Oh. So that kind of wraps it up. It's a pretty broad area of interest. So you do the cool stuff we did in school all day, every day. Yeah. And it's so funny when I was in school, I was constantly told, you know, model building, it's dead. It's never happening. No one does yeah. it anymore. And I think there's this weird perception about how model building is such an old school art form. It's just a bunch of guys in a dark room uh -huh. cutting with exacto knives. But truly, like, the stuff model builders do is pretty cutting edge, um, especially with the technology that we use. And I know the topic today is on 3D printing. And, you know, that's just one prong of a whole suite of right. other things that we use, laser cutting, CNC, vinyl cutting, you know. And on top of that, you also have to be kind of an expert in a ton of different programs because you never know what your client's going to be working with. Oh, I would never thought of that. Right. Yeah, because you got to have everything. Because you can't, you can't assume that SketchUp is going to export the model correctly. Oof, I have a love-hate relationship <laughs> with SketchUp. Yeah. yeah. It seems to me in model building, you either go simplistic, all white stuff, mm -hmm. or you go really detail-oriented, make it look really cool. Yeah, it has to be a choice if yeah. it's going to be simplistic, right? And I also, I'm a big fan of kind of those hybrid methods where a majority of the site is simplistic and then you put all of your effort and detail into your main building, your star and whatnot. <laughs> I was mentioning, I mean, I work with a ton of programs, but I will say this is BIM Thoughts. I primarily work with Revit when it comes to an architectural project. So, uh -huh. you know, dealing with that file format is probably <laughs> my primary job. And I'd say 50% of the work is just, you know, doing digital work and working with what the client has oh, and whatnot. Yeah, you probably have to clean up. You probably have to delete more than you Oof. keep. Yes. <laughs> Very much so. Um, Revit is such a beast. And like you said, half of the process is just getting rid of stuff, especially right. window mullions, furniture, all of that good stuff. Uh -huh. And in the olden days, not that far, <laughs> not, not that long ago, probably <laughs> two years ago, but... <laughs> Um, I used to export it just as a um, DXF or DWG uh -huh. as I think it's a called a CIS model type, uh -huh. which works usually pretty well for 3D printing. Yeah. So that's a really great file format. Because you can STL it now. You know oh. what I do? Mm -hmm. is, Tell me. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm weird. But um, <laughs> I don't do models for architecture i do models for things that i'm interested in like cool. a mars rover that is going to run one day a um all of these things in my office to hold up all of the other things on my ikea pegboards <laughs> i 3d print those so i'll go to thingiverse everyone mm. the revit city of things <laughs> mm -hmm. And find something that's close to what I want, download the STL, then I'll import it in, I just lost a format. I imported it into format, believe it or not, Carl. I believe and then from format, I export it out to a, uh, to a file I can open in AutoCAD to edit it. 
That is convoluted, Bill. It is convoluted because AutoCAD won't read STL files. If AutoCAD would import STL files, I wouldn't have to use Format. Well, Format does it. Uh, Fusion 360 is really handy for that. Uh, yes. Yes, but then I can't I can't take it into AutoCAD where I know how to do most of my model. And this is a Revit thing, and everybody thinks I should bring it into Revit probably. But I'm sorry, I, I, I have to think too much when I'm in Revit. And I really don't want to think about the software. I want to think about what I'm doing, especially when it's my own little thing. If I was doing something for a company I work for, then yeah, I would do it in Revit. That's what they're paying me to do. Well, that's a, that's an interesting tangent that you bring up there, Bill, that sort of leads back to something that Olivier said to start all this was the idea that having to know a bunch of different softwares because you're not sure what the, the client is working about. And we right. kind of all chuckled about that, and then Bill gave us this – and crazy example of how he gets things back around to build a uh, a roll bar for a for a Hot Wheels car is an example. Right, and that's drawn in AutoCAD in metric, by the way. Well, but that's one plus. I'll give you that. Yeah, so you're with me on the metric part, Carl. I am. So, what's your uh, craziest scenario that you've had to use to get from A to B? Uh oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Um, you know, you're describing this convoluted process, but it's not too far from the truth in a professional setting as well. Um, like I said, you never know what people are working with. And I think probably the worst format is a JPEG image <laughs> of your <Yeah>. project. <laughs> Can you make um, a 3D model out of this, please? <laughs> you'd be surprised how often that question comes up. And I don't mean to chide people because, uh -huh. you know, if you're not an expert in the topic, how 3D printing work, how this process works, it can uh -huh. be really daunting and opaque. But yeah, I mean, just starting from an image, you kind of have to work backwards um, to get it up to snuff. Uh, I've recently kind of, I've been trying to streamline the process uh, with just working with Revit into other programs. And I've really been loving the Revit Inside Rhino plugin to go throughout that process. It's just amazing mm. how well it streamlines the data conversion. And it basically transforms all of that Revit information into this perfect cleaned up NURBS model. And it converts all of that Revit property information into properties in Rhino, mm. which has been uh, very, very useful. So I can just turn, I can basically make a Rhino model that converts all of my Revit property pieces into their own separate layers of windows and whatnot. So that's been my primary process lately. And I've been trying to move away from the four-step <laughs> method. It still does happen every once in a while, though. <laughs> yeah. Seems like we're talking a lot more and more about Rhino these days. Yeah, it's definitely my program of choice to do a lot of these uh, projects. I recently did a course on LinkedIn on just uh, 3D printing with Rhino, and it's probably be become one of the most uh, popular courses yeah. that I've created. And I've been interested in developing a course for Revit in 3D printing, but uh -huh. I'm kind of on the fence about it because hmm. so much of the work would have to be done outside of Revit, you know? I could see that. Yeah. Because really all you're interested is in the, is in the core and shell or shell and core, depending on how you look at it, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the building for it. And unless you're building one that you can lift the roof off and see the inside of the building. Mm -hmm. That would be a fun one to build. Yeah, those are always fun. And And I would think you would laser print or laser cut more than you would 3D print. Yeah, I'd say most projects are a combination of different technologies. I've gotten really good at 3D printing complex shapes, but then slapping on some, maybe not slap on, delicately place on <laughs> some laser cut facades. And it really elevates the whole massing yeah. and brings it up to a new level. Because even if you use the best 3D printer out there, there's still some, you know, residual artifacts that are going to 
show up as a mm -hmm. 3D print. It's going to give away that uh, type of detail. And what I love doing in model building is try to use fabrication methods where it's kind of hard to see how it was actually made, uh, especially if, you know, you're not an architect or, you know, you're just a hobbyist mm. in the workspace. You mean you don't just cover up your mistakes with the with the fake grass? <laughs> yeah, fake fake grass on everything, right? Right, right. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, let me let me fix that for you. No, the secret weapon is probably spackle. Actually, spackle. you're joking, but it. Oh my gosh, it's it's spackle. it's a lifesaver. Yeah, I can see uh, that. Oh yeah, so it makes everything uh -huh. absolutely seamless. You can paint it; it looks great. And I even do this on. It depends on the type of 3D print uh, mm -hmm. file, but oh, you know, yeah. putting spackle on the file uh, on the final uh -huh. print, and then you know watering it down, sponging it down, it takes off uh, so much of that striation. Yeah. Um, and I'll do that for an FDM print, the extrusion kind. Mm -hmm. Definitely wouldn't do that for uh, a laser print. <laughs> it wouldn't be worth no. my time. Um, what but about it can be water jet? Effective. Water jet uh, cutting or print printing? Cutting. Right? <laughs> cutting. Oh, cutting. I was well, that wouldn't be good for wood, but it'd be really good for plastic. I would think. Oh, water jet. That's an int so I personally don't have a water jet in my current shop, but I have used one before, and you know I don't like it for uh -huh. cutting plastics and it depends on the type of plastic you have because they all uh -huh. have their internal stresses right right but if you water jet most plastics especially in acrylic it's going to splinter off uh it's mm. the cut line's going to be kind of splintery because you're basically using you know aggregate sand and it's almost exploding inside the thickness oh, of the plastic right i didn't realize that yeah, so it works really great with metal because metal is going to hold its shape. It's not going to have that right. aggregate explode into it. Uh -huh. um, stone as well works really great. But with certain types of plastic, that edge can be pretty rough. And, you know, you have huh. to have a certain thickness of plastic for it to be worth your wild. Um, here, here I always thought it was just water. <laughs> but no, it's water. I used to think that too, right? Water and some sort of aggregate to actually... So it's sanding the piece, yes, as opposed to right anything else in the piece. And and the reason I brought that up is because we looked at a laser cutter at our place because we we have a, a model shop at LPA, oh, but cool. we didn't like cleaning up the burnt edges. Mm. It's impossible. <laughs> it is impossible. I I wish I had a good answer. We didn't like mm -hmm. how the model looked when we were done, unless mm -hmm. you painted the whole thing white mm -hmm. afterwards. I guess that's really the only thing you you can do, but then you've got to wait for the paint to dry. And who wants to do that? It's like waiting for glue to dry. Two hot tips. Obviously, you can always sand off the burned edges, and right. I've spent many hours doing that. But if you're using a thinner cut of wood, uh -huh. what I've found is pretty successful and convincing is if you cover the piece of wood before you laser cut it in some sort of tape and then you laser cut it, um, you can actually pick out a paint that is the same color as your wood and just spray the edges and then remove the tape and you have this wood Oh, mixture. look at you, Miss Smarty but Pants. <laughs> this won't work on thicker wood, right? Because, you know, you have yeah, a you would see thickness, it. right? That is a great but idea. On thin pieces, it, it works great. You know, you can't yeah. tell the difference. It's really seamless. So that's a that's a hot tip. So you so you put like blue tape or, or green right. tape right. on it. I like mm -hmm. the green tape myself. Do you have any more model building questions? <laughs> hot tip problems? <laughs> I had one, but it went away. Oh, I learned not to use PLA for anything you want to survive heat. Oh, what kind of models were you building that needed to be heat resistant? In Las Vegas. The air conditioning could go out in a oh. construction trailer and then all your PLA melts. Or the sun hits it and then it melts. So PETG is the way to go nowadays. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't shrink like ABS. Mm -hmm. I find I'm still using the PLA, I guess, because I'm in a temperate climate. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm not under those stressors. And I haven't been as big of a fan of that type of material only because um, it just clogs up my extruder. I don't like getting it to that hot temperature. Oh, P -E -T -G? But, 
Yeah, but I mean, maybe if you're using, you know, the highest end 3D printer, mine's a few years old. So mine's a Creality Ender three. Oh, an Ender. Okay. Yeah, I have an Ender. Me too. It was cheap and it works. And if the thing nozzle clogs, I throw it away and get a new nozzle because they're like cheap. Oh yeah. Yeah, I have an I have another tip that I learned in hmm. doing my uh, my little cars. If I do the base coat in enamel and do the fine details in acrylic, Mm -hmm. I can wash off the acrylic with water and it doesn't affect the enamel. Or you, another cool tip I learned is if you're using acrylic as your base and you need to put some acrylic on the top for your details Mm -hmm. and you're like me and you screw up a lot, you spray it first with flat. Ah. And then you can wash off the acrylic that you made mistakes on. Mm Mm-hmm. So, Olivia, being that you spend 50% of your time in Revit, what does that look like? I mean, are you hiding stuff in a 3D view to export? Are you doing, you know, just wholeheartedly detaching stuff? Do you have Dynamo scripts and all kinds of awesome stuff to do that for you? View templates? Like, what? what's your process? Oh, my gosh. I wish I had a Dynamo script to do that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> we need to make you one, girl. <laughs> Oh, God. Well, I did get go down a rabbit hole one time to try to do that. And then, you know, Rhino Inside Revit was created and kind of streamlined that process for me a little bit. But to clarify, when I said that, you know, 50% of the work is digital, that's digital in or outside of Revit, right? So maybe 10 to 20% of my time is in Revit, and the rest is in another program to kind of reformat that information to be 3D printable, laser cutter worthy, you know, all of that good stuff. So usually I'm spending less and less time in Revit just because of that Revit inside Rhino plugin. Um, And because you're building things like from scratch rather than getting models that are actually useful. They're very useful for certain things, right? But yeah, that's a really- Yeah, useful um, for you in the 3D modeling or printing aspect. Right. But I think you brought up kind of a good nuance to this that uh, if you have a 3D model, uh, it's not 3D print ready (laughs) uh, necessarily, right? So I'm basically just taking something like a Revit model and using it as a skeleton framework. And almost everything is rebuilt uh, from scratch to get it to the right detail level that, you know, it can go to that next step of being created physically. So most of the Revit work I do is, you know, making myself my own 3D template and, you know, taking out the information that I don't need from it. Um, And then from there, going into Rhino and, you know, organizing all of those pieces, organizing the windows, walls, and depending on the scale, maybe the furniture, uh, and building everything back up again. I will say that the, um, the ACIS export actually is almost 3D print ready if you know, everything weren't at the (laughs) wrong scale. Um, It's a really great file export format for doing things like 3D printing because it can really determine like an inside and outside to your model. You need to have those watertight models for something to become 3D printable. Uh, I hope that wasn't too wordy (laughs) of an explanation. No, it's perfect. It's, It's actually very different than what I was expecting you to say. Just in the sense that, you know, like... I would have thought that the 3D model that you received would have been used in a more robust way rather than remodeling it in a way. There's definitely some pieces that are reused. And I think there's kind of this perception that something like 3D printing is the quick, fast, and easy option. And, you know, that extra labor involved in prepping the model isn't really thought of until you mention it to a client, right? Even if they have a really nice uh, SketchUp model, really nice Rhino model, um, Revit model, there's always some extra work that has to be done. And in very rare cases, no work has to be done. And that makes me (laughs) very, very happy. So what can a what can a client do to their to their model to give it to you so that you can do the least amount of work? Or is that even cost effective for the client and just pay you to do that? 
That's an interesting question because I was trying to weigh that the other day, or not mm -hmm. the other day, a, a few months ago. I was thinking maybe I should make a tutorial on you know proper exporting methods for model building. Uh -huh. uh, maybe this would be a really big time saver. And the more I started to develop this, I realized uh, maybe that isn't the case um, because there's kind of nuances to the model that you don't realize you need until you see them right so if mm -hmm. i gave the direction like get rid of all of your window mullions which is usually what i do uh -huh. you know that could negate a very important piece of information <laughs> that was pivotal to your design but because i gave that direction um you can't kind of think on your feet when you give these strategic uh step-by-step -step instructions so i kind of put that project aside and now I just ask just give me the Revit model I think I can do it faster <laughs> I, I got my system down now um, and I know I know what we need to get the project done it's hard to tell other people what you know right. they need to do and I'm sure you can relate to that on many different <laughs> levels being an expert in your field yes I can definitely relate to that and sometimes it takes longer to tell them what to do than to actually do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, if it's a mentoring situation, I love like going through the steps. I love like right. teaching people well, it's different. how to go about it. Yes, yes. That's completely different mm -hmm. because you're, you are, you have, well, a decision has been made. Either you are investing your time to mentor somebody. Mm -hmm. Or the mentor, mentee, is paying you for your time for you to mentor them. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. It's, both people are winning. It's just that who's, who is, who's making the sacrifice? Mm -hmm. is, is, a, is the mentor making the sacrifice in time? Or is the mentee making the sacrifice in money? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my, that's my deep thought for today. Very deep, Bill. I guess my question is: You mentioned that you're you're now at the the stage where you just say the client can just give you the model and you can you know fine tune it at the back end. But are you using? Is there enough things that are same model over model to do any automation, whether it's Dynamo or with Rhino inside Grasshopper, that you can sort of run a gra run a graph or a script that kind of takes out the levels, removes these, does that, and sort of gets it closer to print ready, sort of automatically? Yes, and. I made a custom script actually using Rhino inside Revit and it almost completely automates the process. I can just plug in my model and it's going to give me the geometry that I need. Now, past that point, you know, you have to think about how a huge model scaled down to fit on a 3D printer at a certain scale. Certain items on that model just aren't going to look right, right? Because you have windows mm -hmm. that are going to be like a micron. <laughs> thick that's not going to work you have fences that are you know going to be non-existent so even if you get like that really nice data into rhino there's still you know this extra nuance that you have to work with to figure out oh what amount of detail do i even want to show right because at certain levels i won't show will window mullions and at just a level you know bigger i might show those mullions so you kind of have to do this calculus to figure out what you need and what you don't need even after this importing process but i will say that the um the grasshopper script that i made really like streamlines the process and actually i even have a tutorial on linkedin learning that's for free so if you search my name and rhino inside revit i think that'll come up and you can download the script if you want so if anyone's interested in model building but you can use it for a lot of other things if you just want to get data into uh rhino you mentioned the the issue with scaling you know inside of Revit, in theory, we mm -hmm. should be designing at one-to-one. -one. So when it comes out to make that model smaller to print, are, are you scaling it in Revit, uh, which I hear everybody's cringing now as I say that, or is it? are you scaling it uh, inside of your slicing program? And which slicer yeah. are you using? No, I think you might have partially answered your own question. Uh, <laughs> no scaling. <laughs> no scaling inside Revit, right? Yes. Um, 
most of the work uh, is done inside Rhino. Sometimes I use Fusion for specific 3D printing projects. Um, Fusion's a little bit better at dealing with solid masses than I think Rhino is. But uh, essentially, you know, I get everything into my program of choice, scale it down, and then I just start measuring, like, what's the current state of this model, right? What <laughs> how big is it, everything right now? And I, in a lot of cases, actually make things, I exaggerate certain details, make them thicker and bigger in order for them to show up correctly in a 3D print or in, you know, a laser cut file or whatnot. So I kind of know the thresholds of all of my uh, 3D printers and I know how thin I can make things or how thin I should make them before the details just don't show up anymore. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a case by case basis and it depends, but you know, uh, you basically pre prep everything. And as far as my slicer, um, I like using simplify a lot for my FDM printers and I really like, well, I have no choice. I only can use, uh, my form preform software to use my, uh, form printer, uh, at the moment. Are you doing any resin printing? Yeah, on my form printer, um, that thing basically paid for itself. Um, it's a great little machine. I have one too, but I don't like using it. Oh. I've, I don't like cleaning it. <laughs> it is a pain. Yeah, it is a pain to clean. When I first got mine, I was thinking, oh, this is going to be so easy. You know, I, I understood how the printing process works, but I had no idea how much time is taken up just like cleaning your model you know, oh, yeah. off the support, sanding it. And, you know, once you do all that work, it really does look nice. But, you know, you're not thinking about those things when you see the quality of the print. Um, but I mean, it's worth it for a paid project. Right. So um, I like it. Thinking about it now, if I were doing it, I wonder if it's worth it using a 3D printer to create the uh, structure of the model. Mm hmm. And then go ahead and put the nice wood sides and all that onto the structure. Because then you could use the 3D printer to get your forms mm -hmm. where you wanted it to be. And then use your your mastery of the materials to make it look good by putting them on the outside of it. And that's actually a pretty common method that I use to kind of glitz up uh, a 3D print <laughs> model because getting some of the intricacies of a model, even if it's small, can be pretty time consuming versus just, you know, printing it out on your printer. And I think in one of my most recent projects um, with uh, Coppin University up in Baltimore, they had, uh, I 3D printed a small clear base and I then put on laser cut pieces of paper that represented the windows and walls and whatnot. Oh, yeah. And, you know, at that scale, it worked really well. I might not do that at a larger scale, though, right? This was a tiny little, like, I think it was 1 to 70 uh -huh. uh, model. And uh, another, like, extra step that I took in this process was, you know, I know that the clear resin on the form actually yellows over time. It mm -hmm. yellows so bad that it'll turn almost orange Oof. if you leave it out in the sun. So not a great situation. So I learned took... that one the hard way, didn't you? <laughs> you know, very embarrassing, right? You like you get this resin print that you know looks clear right now, and then yeah. just can't age over time. Six months later, you get a call saying, "Hey, our windows turned orange." <laughs> Maybe not that fast, but, you know, uh, if you're thinking about long term, uh, I wouldn't use it. But for this project, what I did was I 3D printed it in the resin print. It came out beautiful, really nice finish. And I did a silicone mold of it and casted mm. um, super clear acrylic. And this was particularly useful for this project because I needed to make two identical models. So I had a mold to make, you know, two models from a 3D printed model. And I'm using resin that's gonna look absolutely beautiful over time. It's gonna be crystal clear, more or less, more so than the resin would be. Hmm. Too bad you can't print in silicone. They're getting there though. Wouldn't that be um, great? Cause then you could just print the, mo the <laughs> form. 
the mold yeah i actually was just gonna say i just made a silicone mold and it was incredibly difficult to, yeah. <laughs> to, first off i needed way more silicone than i thought i would and then <laughs> second off getting it out of the mold that i molded the silicone mold in <laughs> was really really difficult uh -huh. and getting all the air bubbles out and... what were you molding i i uh on crap on the side as well just like bill does and i was actually making a coaster holder out of resin but i oh, wanted cool. i had one out of wood that i wanted to cast mm -hmm. out of resin so i made a silicone mold out of the wooden piece and i was really scared that i was gonna like lose the wooden piece forever i was never even gonna get that back but luckily i've been able to successfully mold in resin mm -hmm. from the, the silicone mold despite the incredible challenges that I had getting to this point. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't feel bad. I mean, I don't even feel quite like an expert yet. I, you know, I started this three years ago and I still like hit those real roadblocks, especially with the bubbling. That's, that's really tough to fix if you don't have a degassing chamber and a pressure pot, which I do have chamber. now. <laughs> I, I, um, because of the pouring resin even. Mm -hmm. Right? Like yeah. getting the bubbles out of my resin. Mm -hmm. That would be great too. Works great. Lots of reasons for a degassing chamber, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't you know. have a degassing chamber. I have a I have a cricket cutter. Do you I have a I love my cricket. I do too. Oh, I love my cricket so much. You can see so easy to make a, a SVG. Yeah, and you, boom, you cut it out. I'm actually curious. Let me ask you a question about that. Have you ever cut wood on that cricket cutter? I've seen some videos regarding it. Um, and I was very interested in it because I was like, oh, finally a solution for this laser etched burning edge problem uh, with the laser cutter. I can see the cricket cutting thin wood. Very mm -hmm. thin. If you can get it to do multiple passes. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. That's going to be your nice thing. You think might get you a get few it clean do, cuts and that's it. I don't think you can get it to do multiple passes. You'd go through so many blades. Okay. Well, yeah. no, this wasn't the not worth it. This this wasn't the resource that I wanted. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> you're anyway. going to have to you're going to have to get a mill, a CNC mill. Oh yeah. And I do mill a lot of work, but for those finer pieces, it's just not worth it. Like, yeah. you know, you're going to blow apart your your little wood uh building if you cnc route it even with a fine bit yeah that's true what about one of those uh thermal molds or vac molds you know where you put something in there and then you hit a button and it goes and it makes oh, a yeah. plastic piece vacuum form no i do have a funny story on the thermo forming i used to work at a makerspace just uh as a contractor doing classes and whatnot um and in the thermo forming class um the guy teaching the class, he always says, now go around the shop and pick something you want to thermoform. But I got to warn you, it has to be really solid. And this guy insisted on thermoforming his phone. And the teacher said, you know, I can't guarantee that this phone is going to come out all right. Are you sure you want to? I really don't want to do this. Are you sure you want to do it? And lo and behold, thermoforms it and cracks the phone in half like a big crack on the side because it takes <laughs> so much vacuum force to pull out the air so that that plastic yeah. is gonna like suck around it right right you know <laughs> and of course the guy was angry right <laughs> we warned you man <laughs> yeah wow yeah don't uh don't vacuum form your phone <laughs> no electronics right it's like all good shop teachers have nine fingers isn't that Ugh. scary how that's true? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had three different shop teachers, and they all had less than 10. They all had less than 10. That is so scary. Oh, my God. Do they, do, they get, do they get hurt on the job and then trained as a shop teacher? Is that what happens? Uh, maybe just to, for that whole factory. Like, everybody remembers that. They go, so I'm going to be extra careful around the Yeah. Or or do or is it just part of the last day of shop teacher school? Okay, we're gonna chop off a finger now so that you can <laughs> show your students what not to do, and that's how they graduate. Every time I walk into my wood shop, I just think, "Is today gonna be the day?" <laughs> is today gonna be the day? No, I definitely, I, I'm still, I have a strong respect for all of my tools, and I just, you know, you before know? I even use one, I just think about now, how can this go wrong? What are the things? That could go wrong <laughs> and and i think that's the key that 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 healthy respect is is what 
makes it go mm-hmm. through. Always have that little bit of fear. Don't be scared, but understand that things can right. happen. And so then you're in the moment when you're using the piece. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't ever get comfortable with the power tool. As our good friend Adam Savage would say. <laughs> you watch his YouTube channel too? I used to be an avid watcher of his channel. Not so much anymore. Not so much watching of anything anymore. <laughs> Pretty busy. Um, but no, I I love his stuff. I would love I to meet him. I mean, I don't want to fangirl too much, but, you know, he started out his career in model building as well. So it'd be really interesting to, like, get that perspective of, you know, you came at it from model building in the movies, which is a whole, it's a whole nother beast as compared to architectural model modeling. And, you know, I'm definitely not an expert in that area, but I see model building in the movie industry is kind of being pulled back way more than model building in the architecture industry. There still seems to be a market here for architects and engineers. And the two models are completely different. Like a, I would right. think that a model for a television or movie is like a 10 foot away model mm-hmm. where an architecture model is a six inch away model mm-hmm. as far as the level of detail. Mm-hmm. Cause people are really getting into that model and looking at it. Mm-hmm. Right. Where on a movie, you you go buy it in two seconds, you're done with it. And even at that, these models, to make them look great, you know, they have to be built at a pretty big scale, right? Like one right. foot equals one inch. So you get that flyby, but, you know, they're almost human size. You know, you could also almost crouch next to them. Whereas, yeah. you know, with architectural model building, you can make the tiniest model in the world. Uh so what else is exciting in the world of model building? I mean, just generally model building or what's what's up with my life? <laughs> Whatever you want to talk about sure. in the last few minutes. Um, I recently started doing some consultant work with ZGF trying to get their model building shop up in order. And, oh. you know, I started this kind of side service of just doing consulting work with firms uh-huh. to build up their shop resources. And it seems like there's a lot of interest in, you know, trying to do a lot of this visual representation in-house. Mm-hmm. So that's been pretty fun. And it's it's also pretty nice to like, you know, give out a design and a budget and not have any ties to the firm. So if they don't take my advice, I don't have to, you know, live with any of that decision making or those repercussions. I can just, you know, right. uh, wash my hands clean. But, you know, it, it's it's a really fun um, problem solving like budget thing that I enjoy doing because you never know. Every firm is going to need a different tool. And sometimes people need just a 3D printer. And sometimes they need just a laser cutter or foam cutter. um, And that's Mm going to go a long way. And having those discussions is pretty interesting. I feel like a lot of people who, you know, ask for this consulting work kind of want the biggest and best shop ever (laughs) without understanding, you know, how people are going to use this. Mm -hmm. And their budget's a Harbor Freight budget. (laughs) <laughs> hey, don't knock Harbor Freight. I've gotten a hand, just a handful, though. A handful of good tools <laughs> from them. Yeah, I have a lot of Harbor Freight tools. Mm-hmm. I, what my, my thing is, is I'll go to Harbor. If I need a tool, mm-hmm. and I don't know if I'm going to use this tool forever, if it's the right tool, I'll go to Harbor Freight and buy their version. Right. And then after I use it and learn more about the tool and decide, well, you know, do I keep this one or do I buy a... Nipex, or do I buy a Proxon now? Or mm-hmm. what about AR stuff? Oh yeah, this is pretty interesting. So I've only recently started kind of developing these services, but uh-huh. I'm really interested in kind of that uh, transition between a physical model and what you see in AR space. So mm-hmm. imagine, you know, a very plain physical model, but you could take an iPad app and maybe switch through different facade facade Mm. designs or different greenery designs outside, Mm. but you're just working with that one physical model. So if you're working on a project with a lot of constraints, like 
you know, our block size is only this big, you could make a partial physical model to bring to, you know, meetings or to mm -hmm. a client and have this custom app that adds this really interesting extra level of detail. And I'm kind of more of the mindset that, um, you know, AR technology to be adopted needs to be incredibly easy and there needs to be gateway drugs with <laughs> with uh, using apps, uh, using apps yeah. on the phone first. The cell to get someone to put on a headset, it's astronomically harder than, you know, giving someone an iPad app. It's not even, people don't even consider it AR at that point. And that's how you right. get kind of people interested in that type of work. Mm -hmm. I can see that. It's just like the the comment I made earlier about AutoCAD, you want them to experience the model, not experience the software. Mm -hmm, exactly. And even before this recording, we were talking about coding and whatnot. And like my end goal, you know, uh, I guess it'll be recorded here, but in 10 years, I'd really love to make applications for Revit kind of streamlining that AR mm -hmm. process. So yeah. let's say you could take... Um, a Revit plan and say, I'd like to have, um, you know, a 3D um, render at this one spot in the plan. And you could take that, print it out, and then you'd have an app that uses your plan as a tracking device. And you can give it out to people and they can be transported by just um, putting their iPhone over that plan to that 3D render of that spot. So, you know, I'm thinking about a lot of, <laughs> if that makes sense, right? Yeah. <laughs> this isn't a visual medium, but um, I'm thinking. I really would like to make a variety of different AR plugins that work uh, in tandem with, you know, programs like Revit. Right. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if like a casino or, or someone building a resort somewhere had a mm -hmm. 3d, had a 3d model built, mm -hmm. nice one built. You didn't, you know, you hired you to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you have that, the QR codes in different right. places along the model and they just pop up their phone and scan the QR code and the way they go and see different parts or get different information about that model right. or about the building, not about the model, but about the building in that particular area. Mm -hmm. And you probably said it better than me. Um, that's a perfect description of what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could see a ton of different applications for this right. too. With museums, you know, they could have oh, a pre-existing yeah. exhibit and they could add an extra layer of interest by having this downloadable app. And you get this whole new level of interaction with the exhibit and, you know, gather more interest alongside it. Dana. I'm sure you've got a final thought to bring this all home. Well, no, I think it's all been super, super interesting hearing, you know, all of the passions that Olivia has and, you, you know, what she's been doing. I think that the, the Rhino Inside Revit piece is, you know, I think it's revolutionary for everybody, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. I think you're right. Rhino is just so much better in terms of mm -hmm. geometry. It's just hands down. I, I do. I really do. And I have Marcelo's book, the the... Uh, reference manual, Grasshopper oh, cool. and Dynamo reference manual. So I definitely have every reason to get in there and start to play with Grasshopper and create forms and, awesome. and Rhino. And then work with you and 3D Oh, printing. yeah. Right. <laughs> it's always fun projects. Or I guess you don't do 3D printing, you do 3D making. Ooh, that's a good way to think about it, actually. That's a good rebranding um, right. opportunity. <laughs> because you're using different mediums to create the, the final product. Right. You use whatever the best medium is for that particular part. Mm -hmm. You don't just throw it in the, in the 3D printer and then have a bunch of horizontal lines out everywhere saying, oh, yeah, right. that's, the, that's a brick. Right. Yeah. Um, and maybe to round all of this out, um, I remember that when 3D printing was just coming out that mm -hmm. um, everyone was telling me this is going to be the end of model building. No one's, you know, these 3D printers, these are going to be the panacea, the answer to mm -hmm. all of our 
<laughs> physical modeling questions. And I think now after kind of a decade of this technology being mainstreamed, uh, people are kind of understanding the nuance of it a little bit better and understanding that 3D printing is just like another tool in the toolbox that's changing how we work. It's not getting rid of a job. It's just making our jobs easier in some ways. Yeah, I agree. And sometimes you just 3D print a part to see if it'll fit and then make right. it the right way. Mm -hmm. and, and throw away the little 3D part. <laughs> they make great cat toys. Ah. Oh, I bet. All of my 3D <laughs> printed scraps. Cat. Yep, all my 3D printed scraps the cats play with. The small ones. The small cats. No, the small. <laughs> <laughs> the small scraps. The small scraps. Okay. <laughs> well, on that note... I guess we'll get the meow out of here. And uh, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Can I tell people where to find me? Absolutely. <laughs> I have to get it in there. Always plugging. Uh, <laughs> Always plugging. Yeah, if you want to find me, I'm on uh, Model Spaces on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. If you search your Model Space. And if you want to find us on the interwebs, we're on yourmodelspace.com yourmodelspace.com mm -hmm. all right that's all i got head over to yourmodelspace.com and learn more